the clerk pl please read the quote for the day. Thank you, Mayor. Effective teamwork begins and ends with consistent and effective communication. Thank you. Tonight we have uh, Boy Scout Troops 861, uh, some representatives here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like these gentlemen to come forward. Uh, David Esparza, Nigel Thiel, Dylan Detloff. Okay, please stand. Clerk, please call the roll. There are 13 present. Alderperson Holshue, uh, Schneider, and Drawn are all excused this evening. Next, we'll move on to uh, the approval of the minutes from our last council meeting. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next would be confirmation of mayor's appointments. City Attorney. We have one uh, from the mayor submitting the following appointment for your consideration. Kyle Welton to be considered for appointment to the library board to fill, to fill the unexpired term of Nia Yang, whose term expires uh, April 30th, 2020. Thank you. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to confirm. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Eyes. Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to the public forum. Turn it over to the city clerk. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first on our list this evening is Mike Burnett. Mike, if you could come up to the front, please. <laughs> Mike, can I have your home address? 1925 South 26th Street. And you will have five minutes, sir. All right. All right, new faces, something different here, but same old story. And it's like, it's armory time. And it's like, I <coughs> kind of had my mind blown the other week when Chad was up here talking about the armory and the four inches of water in the basement. We don't know how it got there, la la la, what we're gonna do about it. And I'm like, I see the annual report of the city. Turns out we have a lot of inspectors and engineers in our employ. They should maybe walk into that building and determine what the exact nature of the damage is. I personally have a photographic treasure trove of the armory right before Spaceport moved out and it's showing to a detail corners and walls, you name it, you want it from sections of ceilings. I even have a thing called a gigapixel which is literally a huge picture, if it would be of this room, you could go on to any document in here and read it of the entire inside of the armory that could be looked at, it's online, and you can see the condition of the armory. And when you're talking about a building that obviously nobody wanted, we worked very hard as the Armory Foundation because we did have plans and goals for that building. More importantly, we realized the beauty and value of that building. And when Chad was saying, what would happen if a nonprofit came in and took that money and restored that building? My God, you just got one of the best buildings in the world for a very, very <coughs> small amount of money. And oh, if they wouldn't be paying taxes, that's your whole development plan is based on the TIF 
district, which is the art of not paying taxes and shifting them for development funds. This would have been, we literally didn't ask for a penny at the time. The building is in a slightly worse repair because, no, quite frankly, nobody's taking care of it. There is an employee working in that building every day, either that or somebody's living in the building, because somebody's coming and going every day. And I'm pretty sure the Department of Public Works is still operating some operations out of that building. It, but it amazes me, once again, I mean, you're moving for a number, which you did get a number in de demolition probably about three and a half years ago, because I got something forwarded to me on it, and it was way north of $500,000. And that's about when C's stepped out of the picture is when that was published online, the document that we got at the time. And I'm saying right now, and it's like nobody wants to continue this fight in any means, but it's a no-brainer to see that it's been an intentional move of the city to get rid of this building for decades now. And the bottom line is the building doesn't want to go. And it's one of those things that right in here, nobody here knows firsthand the condition of that building. And it's like, you don't really, I mean, maybe one or two of you have stepped in it. But bottom line is, it's an asset or a liability, however you look at it, but it needs to be taken care of. And really, our only goal, where we got turned back and rebuffed, when you decided you needed to go through all this paperwork and quite frankly, bullshit, what you guys did, all we asked is to come in the building, document the condition, and then start laying ground to make sure it didn't deteriorate and slowly improve it. This is when the city fought back on us. And this is not something I imagined. We had a group of good people working hard on this. And we spent most of our effort trying to fight the fight of proving the worth of the building. I believe we won that fight. We won it handily. I mean, the press can keep saying about all this and bad about the armory, but there's so much online that you can find and that has been presented showing that it's really not true. It's basically a fabrication that was made up decades ago and it just keep on pumping on. The armory was discontinued and demeaned in order to try to represent, in order to try to justify spending on other buildings. And the bottom line is, the armory has been on the chopping block since before you heard of Blue Harbor. And coincidentally, that's why it was originally on the block. And it's one of those things that it upsets me. You even have to come up here and talk about this stuff. And to this point, nobody has ever asked any questions regarding any of this other than that, and I battled with the press online, even having former editors going, we know we were wrong in the past, but what are we supposed to do about it? And it's like, you can't blame us. Excuse and me, Mike. Your time is up. All right. You get my point. Bye. Thank you. Next on the list is Debbie DeMilan. <clears throat> Debbie, can I have your home address, please? Yes, it's 1704 North 35th Street. Uh, Okay, and you'll have five minutes. Okay, so um, I want you to refuse the contentious annexation. Kohler wants to build a golf course on his nature preserve, better known as the Black River Forest, a migratory flyway, home to diverse flora and fauna, wetlands, sand dunes, Indian artifacts, and Indian mounds. Kohler has prevented this wildlife refuge from being developed until now. A golf course would destroy this ecological gem. The most significant losses would be environmental, further impairing the Black River, the town's well water, and Lake Michigan, an important water resource for the whole Midwest. Since the environmental impact and alteration of the Black River Forest has not been submitted by Kohler Company or approved by the town of Wilson, Kohler, in an unneighborly hostile fashion, petitions the city of Sheboygan to questionably annex his property, which is not at all adjacent to city boundaries. Some think this will financially benefit Sheboygan. However, Kohler has sued his own village for three years of back taxes, totaling almost $2 million. 
Kohler's Whistling Straits also dried up residents' wells in the town of Mosul. Could the damages that the town of Wilson residents suffer lead to a lawsuit if Sheboygan annexes the Black River Forest without considering the neighbors who have to live with the consequences of Kohler's project? Kohler, a billionaire, is also re requesting state park land to be able to enter his course. This is the rich stealing from the public. How shameful. But the, both the course and park sharing an entrance would stifle park tourism, a major source of revenue for Sheboygan. Runoff from the course polluting Lake Michigan would deter tourists as well. Kohler's golf clients buy package deals and stay at his hotels and eat at his restaurants. Sheboygan businesses would receive little benefit. Kohler is no friend to the environment. He has a Superfund toxic dump which stretches eight miles in Sheboygan County, leaching those toxins into the groundwater. As for the ethics of this annexation, we need to consider the neighbors and the impact that this major decision would have upon the residents of the town of Wilson. People living near golf courses can contract cancers from the toxic pesticides and herbicides. Don't rush this annexation through without study of the environmental, economic, or ethical repercussions. I protest this travesty and demand a sustainable task force study and a public hearing to include Town of Wilson residents. But in the end, raising an entire forest, destroying wetlands, impairing Lake Michigan and the Black River, as well as the well water, Etc. It doesn't take rocket science to realize that there's nothing positive for the environment if Kohler replaces a complete ecosystem with a sterile golf course green. Residents of the town of Wilson wanted to come and state their objections and the reasons, as well as give you a stack of petitions from the town residents objecting to the building of a golf course in the Black River Forest. But I was alerted about this matter at 4 p.m., too late for them to change their plans. So I would suggest in the future that we don't limit the public forum to what's on the agenda if they can change the agenda or add matters at the very last minute. I think you know, any city matters should be able to be discussed in the public forum whenever, um, you know, at every common council meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Next on the list is Mary Favish. Mary, if you could come up to the front, please. Can I have your home address? Yes, it's 5631 Driftwood Lane. Okay, and you'll have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I just found out that uh, some of the issues regarding this uh, proposed annexation of parts of Wilson and Kohler Andre Park were going to be discussed tonight. Um, there was actually less than 24 hour notice given. Uh, Mr. Adams has spoken with our attorney. Uh, indicating that if you are not going to vote on an issue, if you're just going to discuss, 24-hour notice is not necessary. We, in fact, and our attorney, uh, who is, uh, represents Friends of the Black River Forest, uh, he has a different legal opinion on that. So I'm sorry that these several items were added to the agenda and not given people the opportunity. We we attempted to sign up last week thinking it might be discussed and it was not on the agenda. These items were put on at noon today. But aside from that, I have nothing prepared other than to say I spent several hours today talking to professors and people in planning departments at universities in Chicago, Milwaukee, and Madison. And I asked them about the process of doing a, develop, a, a complete development impact assessment. And I said, what's included in this? And I kind of knew because I had researched it earlier, but what they said was, well, a complete picture involves assessing impacts to quality of life, other social impacts, the environment, fiscal, transportation, and economic. And we are just extremely surprised that the, the government employees and officials of Sheboygan involved in coming up with uh, working with Kohler on this would use only 
the economic uh, impact report, which, by the way, has never been independently verified by the city. And I asked one of the professors if one of your students was given the job of coming up with an economic impact uh, piece of the puzzle. And you said, where did you get that information? And the student said, the developer told me. Um, but this is not acceptable. It's not vetted and it's not validated. And I think you owe the people of the city of Sheboygan to know all the costs that will come to them. The cost of cleaning up pollution is multi-million dollar. The waters along Lake Michigan shore and Black River are already impaired. And knowing that, for you to approve a golf course eventually after the annexation, a project like this saying, well, we don't need to know about any of that because the DNR is going to take care of it. That's very short-sighted. We can give you a history just this past year of DNR um, caused environmental crises throughout the state. So for you to rely on an agency which is being sued on several fronts right now to determine the impact, I also think is short-sighted. So please, figure out the costs of all of the impacts. Don't just look at the money. And by the way, I read the uh, PowerPoint uh, that the city uh, apparently has prepared, uh, which uses the Kohler information and Kohler economic impact assessment. There are huge gaps huge in the cost of the city of Sheboygan. Please give this more professional attention. Please don't just look at what you think you're going to have within a year or five years or ten years because our children, everybody who comes here to enjoy the resources of Lake Michigan will be affected by your decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And last on the list is Alize Desmoulins. Alize, can we have your home address, please? Yes, I live at 1704 North 35th Street in Sheboygan. Okay, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and you will have five minutes. Thank you. So I have a number of questions to ask on um, to ask for Kohler when you're considering this proposal for annexation as alderman. So why if Kohler thinks the city can provide more services did they string the town of Wilson along for three years without mentioning this and also do a quiet buy up of property to arrange a contentious annexation? Gottsack, or commercial realty, approached a resident in 2015 about selling his home, saying it was for an undisclosed buyer. One of the homes purchased, which has renters, is owned by Wilson Sheboygan County LLC with the same address as Gottsack, or commercial realty. Why did Kohler not tell the town that they thought it was not as financially secure as the city? Did this just dawn on them last week when they announced their petition to annex? Kohler attorneys told the town board last year they would not finish the town's conditional use permit application until they had all necessary permits together. Then on April 7th, the DNR informed Kohler their wetland permit was incomplete. The plan commission asked Kohler if they would be proceeding with the arranging payment for the consultants hired. Their attorney said they would <coughs> think about this. In a month, Kohler pulled out its surprise petition for annexation. All this is very strange dealings, but since we're on the subject of economic impacts, do they have any interest in separating out their economic numbers to indicate what amount of money will be spent in local businesses? Have they done any research on what local businesses say they benefited from the previous tournaments? Have they separated out the $80 million that goes to the PGA for a tournament? The people who do support small local businesses are the 400 plus annual visitors and campers at Kohler Andre State Park. 
golfer to pay $400 for a round of golf frequent high-end Kohler venues, not your small local businesses that support the economy of Sheboygan. With 300 plus tournament attendees, the visitors and campers will stop visiting as they wait on County V, the main access point to the park will be interminable or completely unapproachable during tournaments, as is already the case for the town of Mosul. They have, they will block off a lot of roads so that their their um, golf attendees have, you know, privileged access. Will V be wi widened to provide a separate lane all the way from 43, with a dedicated lane going directly to the dedicated roundabout lane to the golf course? <coughs> Who pays the tab for this? The county and taxpayers do, as we did for Kohler's off-ramp on 43, leading directly to the entrance of Whistling Straits. Why will they not release information on what the specific jobs and the salaries are for even their current golf courses? We know for a fact that with our climate, et cetera, they will be seasonal and part-time. You won't have full-time work on a golf course in the middle of January. So you, most of your jobs that they've been mentioning will be part-time and seasonal, so no benefits, et cetera. Has Kohler or the city studied the cost of taxpayers who pick up all the tab for cleaning up pollution? Pollution of the lake and our river has a marked impact on our, on our economy in terms of our tax dollars paying for pollution cleanup and the loss of tourism dollars. Who paid for the Superfund cleanup that was already mentioned, the Superfund site in, in Sheboygan County that runs through the Eight miles that was that was created or generated by the Kohler foundry waste and that has leached chemicals into the groundwater and the Sheboygan, the Onion and Mullet rivers that are the tributaries to Sheboygan River. Those PCBs we have been cleaning up for a long time, as you are probably well aware. So the taxpayers will be paying for all this. Who will pay for the county's goal to clean up the Black River and its watershed? Taxpayers. So there's a lot of hidden costs in this if you decide to go through with it. Every agency involved in pollution cleanup is paid for or by our tax dollars. How will your constituents feel about all these added costs onto you know, this project that was not mentioned, not brought up by Kohler Company, et cetera? So, you know, and I mean, we think uh, Kohler mentions that they're always so environmentally friendly, but they ignore the massive loads of construction and stormwater runoff of pesticides, fertilizers, and sediment into the lake and Black River. This process is a fact and will immediately be apparent in murky sediment loaded into the water on the shore. So I really wish you would consider all these you know, impacts when you're looking at the economy, especially the pollution cleanup. Thank you. Thank you, Alizé. That's it for this evening. Thank you very much. Next, we'll move on to a presentation by Municipal Court Judge Natasha Torrey called Welcome to Sheboygan Kohler Municipal Court. like you to take a note, whether it be writing something down or with your device and answer three quick questions. First question, multiple choice A or B, <coughs> does in 2016, did the city of Sheboygan Village of Kohler Municipal Court handle A, less than 5,500 citations or B, more than 5,500 citations? A would be less than, 5,500 B is more than. Again, we're talking about 2016. Second question, true or false, in 2016, did the city of Sheboygan Police Department write 200 more citations than they did in 2015? True, true or false? Third true or false question, there were over 200 less citations written for building code violations in 2016 than 2015. True or false? So we'll come back to those later. Really happy to, or excited to be here tonight. I've been meaning to come for a while, and in fact, I was so excited that I was told that I was overzealous in my PowerPoint presentation that I prepared. And, and so thanks to the mayor, you will not hear 51 slides. 
you'll hear 15, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, because um, I am excited about the topic, I'm planning to have an open house later this fall. And so I'll make sure to invite you all, and it'll be open to the public. And if you want to see that whole PowerPoint now, feel free to email me. And I do have a uh, city email. It's natasha.tory at sheboyganwi.gov. And I'll send that to you, and you don't have to wait. All right, if we could go. Sue, Sue is going to help me tonight with my, with my presentation, going through the slides. I'll start talking even with that technical difficulty, OK? All right, so Wisconsin has over 240 municipal courts. And municipal courts are community-based justice courts. Community-based, it's a community-based alternative to the criminal justice system. So municipal courts are not criminal courts. They're civil courts. A defendant in the municipal court is not accused of committing a crime. Anyone that is convicted in the municipal court is convicted of a civil forfeiture infraction. So they owe forfeitures, not fines. And so that's something that I find that I have to keep um, reminding myself sometimes in, in my language, and, and so now we're on the fourth slide. The municipal court is, Next slide. it's um, the, the fourth slide, a co-equal branch of the municipal government. Thank you. And so we have the legislative body, which would be the council or the village board. We have the executive, which would be the mayor, an administrator, and then the municipal court. Next slide. So basically, uh, the way th that our hierarchy is, is the voters, the Sh city of Sheboygan Village of Kohler voters, then I would be below them. I have a clerk, and I have a deputy clerk. We handle various types of cases, which would include non-criminal traffic violations, including first offense OWIs. And Wisconsin is the only state in the nation that does that. And we also do something else a little more strange than that. You can actually have a second offense OWI handled in municipal court as long as it's been more than 10 years since your first. We handle criminal code that has been adopted by ordinances, and that could be disorderly conduct, retail theft, trespass, Shoplifting is an example. Other ordinance violations, which would be building code violations or zoning. And we also uh, handle juvenile ordinance violations or truancy violations. And so in Sheboygan, we actually have two separate evenings a month where we have just juvenile hearings, and those are closed proceedings. So each juvenile and their family comes into my chambers and we have a separate hearing for them. And the, the point of, of that is because for the juveniles, our goal is to try to get to the bottom of what's going on in their life and hopefully make an impact. One example of a ordinance violation that I do uh, come across would be possession of mar marijuana, and that could be marijuana or paraphernalia. And I know that we have lots of different opinions in our country about legalization of marijuana. Wisconsin, it's not legal. But it can be a code violation in the city of Sheboygan. And if a police officer decides to issue a marijuana citation as a municipal court citation, that can have a um, much different impact on, on anyone, but especially young people. If a ticket is written for someone as a crime, or excuse me, as a municipal court um, forfeiture or, or citation, then there would be a forfeiture assigned to it, and our range of penalty for that is between $250 and, and $1,000 um, plus cost. So 376 to I, 1,329, somewhere near that plus cost. But then they don't have a criminal record. If they're issued a ticket that goes to circuit court, 
then the, the penalty is increased, and later on I'll get into that a little bit more. But you can also have a situation where a young person's not able to get federal financial aid because they, if they are convicted of that and, and it is a crime involving drugs. And so that's a huge difference of impact that having a um, municipal court can make um, in a young person's life. So obviously there are some advantages for defendants for having a municipal court. If you receive a municipal court citation, you don't end up with a criminal record. It's not searchable on CCAP. I do explain to young people that if they plan to go in the military, recruiters come to the municipal court because they know it's not available on CCAP and they want to see if they had any, any citations. But that's still, that's still you know, a big difference. They don't have to tell anyone that they were convicted of, of a crime if they had a municipal court <coughs> citation. There's no jail time associated with it unless they're not paying their forfeiture for good cause, but there's no automatic jail time. And a citation in municipal court is $76.50 less expensive for that defendant than it would be in circuit court, and I'll break that down again a little bit later. The advantages for, for the city or village are that you have prompt, efficient, and cost-effective adjudication of cases. I so was recently speaking with the village of Kohler police chief, and he was telling me about um, when Kohler was interested in joining and having the municipal court, it was a time that they would send cases to the district attorney's office and sometimes wait seven years and then hear back that it wasn't going to be prosecuted. And so nothing at all was done. And that doesn't happen when you have a municipal court. Municipal court trials aren't stacked and treated like they're the least important thing like they can be in the, in the circuit court. And, and you don't waste um, time for police officers sitting in the court all day or even attorneys sitting in the court just to be told um, that they have to come back because their case wasn't important or an, another trial bumped them. There's also an advantage that it's, it's community-based justice and so it's um, it's, we're not hamstrung based on uh, statewide initiatives. We can focus on um, things that are important to us. For instance, I mentioned um, that we have separate nights for juveniles, and we also have a program for kids to have a relationship with uh, police officers, maybe to work off community service. And that's something that kids can be really specific and, and can change and be fluid based on what our needs are at the time. I just um, volunteered at a Habitat for Humanity event this weekend and was asked, um, could, could I, would I agree for people to cut grass this summer um, to work off um, some of their forfeitures? And, and I, can, I can do that if, if someone wants to, to work off a forfeiture that way, and that might not be as easy to do with a circuit court citation. Ba you know, I know that our council and, and, and um, citizens are concerned about revenue impacts that a court can have, and, and, and it is absolutely true that there's a revenue advantage. And so basically, um, there is a $38 increase in revenue for every citation that you have when you have a municipal court. And so this just is an example of, so then if for every 1,000 citations, that's $38,000 advantage. Having a municipal court then can also can make a municipality be more fiscally responsible. There's, again, greater flexibility in collecting unpaid court obligations. I was just talking to um, the current district attorney who indicated to me that he's having a problem with the clerk of court's office being willing to certify restitution debt um, to be collected. So we don't have that problem. We certify our own debt. Just uh, last year, we started using the state debt collection program, and we're, we're having some good um, outcome with that. It's a little slower than we had hoped, but we're having some good outcome with that. Some other remedies that we have are, are the ability to suspend licenses if, if that would be appropriate. We can more closely monitor payment plans. People can come to uh, the municipal court and enter a pay payment plan right there. They don't have to wait for a court date. Um, they don't have to necessarily have, have a hearing or, or hear back from the judge because it's my policy that 
I allow payment plans at all times um, if it's reasonable. And there is also still the, the remedy of commitment to the county jail, but then because of the closer oversight, we also have the ability to have people released much more quickly. And so then you don't have as much of an expenditure. Referred to court costs earlier. And so where you can see the biggest difference is, this is an example of if you have a $30 speeding ticket, Costs get added to that, so your ticket's not $30. If you were issued the same ticket, for instance, for going eight above, that ticket in the city would be $98.80. If you're outside of the city, or you're in, in a jurisdiction that does not have a municipal court, and it has to go to the circuit court, that ticket then is gonna be $175.30. What's the most interesting about that, and you can keep going, I'm not sure which slide I got to explain that, okay, is if you don't have that municipal court, the municipality is gonna get $25 out of that 175. If you have a municipal court, the municipal court is gonna get 63 out of that 98.80. So you have this double impact. And I, and I think that that's something that really needs um, to be understand. If you take anything away from, from this tonight, understand when you have a municipal court, your citizens do have repercussion if that's what you want. There can be hopefully some impact on behavior, but it's a lot less harsh for them and it's a lot more beneficial to the municipality. And that's where that $38 um, fit that I mentioned before comes from, because again, if you only have a circuit court, you're gonna get 25. The difference between that 63, that uh, 25 and 63 is 38, so you get 38 more dollars per citation if you have a municipal court. And, and again, that's when you go through all the figures, that's where then the defendant also saves 7650 when you have a municipal court. That is all I planned to get through tonight. So again, if you are interested in um, the rest of my PowerPoint, please feel free to email me and, um, and I'll get you information then about our open house later this fall. So thank you. Natasha, thank you very much for that report. We appreciate it. I should answer, I should um, go back to the quiz though, I'm sorry. Yeah. Again, I, again with getting excited. All right, so that first question was true or false, the city of Sheboygan Village of Kohler Municipal Court, excuse me, I'm not, I'm not doing this correctly. A, in 2016, the Municipal Court handled less than 5,500 citations or B, more than 5,500. Um, who thinks that the answer is A, less than 5,500? All right, well, B is correct. We handled more than 5,500. In 2016, we handled 5,975. True or false, there were over 200 more citations written by police, by the police department in 2016. Who thinks that's true? That is true. There were over 200 more in 16 than 15. And the last one, true or false, there were over 200 less citations written for building code violations in 2016 than 15. Who thinks that that is true? That's also true, there are 200 less. And there's lots of good reasons for that. Great. Thank you. Next item is uh, mayor's announcements. Well, I'd like uh, to ask uh, Chris Domagolski to come forward. Tonight we have a proclamation. Whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week, week in which May 15th falls is National Police Week. And whereas the members of Sheboygan Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of citizens in Sheboygan. And whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the problems, duties, and responsibilities of their police department and the members 
of our police department recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression or intimidation. Whereas the Sheboygan Police Department has grown to be a modern and scientific law enforcement agency which unceasingly provides vital public service, I now therefore, Mike Vandersteen, call upon the citizens of Sheboygan and upon all patriotic, civil, educated organizations to observe the week of May 14th through the 20th of 2017 as Police Week in which all of our people may join in commemorating the police officers past and present who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities, have rendered a dedicated service to their communities, and in de doing so, have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and security of all citizens. I call upon all citizens to observe May 15th of 2017 as Peace Officers Memorial Day to honor those peace officers who through their courageous deeds have lost their lives or have become disabled in the performance of their duty. Chris, I present this proclamation to you. Next, I'd like to ask Public Works Director David Beeble to come forward. I think he wants to bring some others. Yeah, if you don't mind, on. I'd like to bring our, our Public Works team up this evening to okay. the pro proclamation. So. Okay. The proclamation, whereas public work services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, whereas the support and understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings, and solid waste collection. And whereas the health and safety and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services. And whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials. And whereas the efficiency and of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is material influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work that they perform. I now, now therefore, Mike Vandersteen as mayor of the city of Sheboygan to hereby proclaim the week of May 21st through 27th as National Public Works Week in the city of Sheboygan and call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. And David, I will present this to you. Thank you, Mayor. I just uh, would like to say we the public works men and women of Sheboygan, we're going to be hosting the, coming this Saturday an open house at the Municipal Service Building as well as at our wastewater treatment plant. Uh, at the service building, we're going to have equipment on display in our parking lot and personnel around to allow people to access and get in the equipment, see what it's about, and answer questions about what we do for the community. And at our treatment plant, we're going to talk about our processes as well as offer an opportunity for residents to pick up our natural fertilizer that we produce at the plant. Um, we also encourage the citizens that attend our open house to please bring a non-perishable food item as we are also collecting food for the Sheboygan County Food Bank during this week. So thank you. And I'd also like to call up Ken Vigaletti and Hannah Shear. Whereas the city of Sheboygan recognizes that investment in creative economy development, creative placemaking, and civic engagement through the arts and creativity are important to the health and vibrancy of the community and its future. And whereas the city of Sheboygan appreciates that the creative economy development and community cultural engagement are directly related to economic vitality, education for the 21st century, engaging residents, and a community's vibrancy and success. 
And whereas the City of Sheboygan celebrates many impressive creative economy activities, projects and initiatives, such as educational programs that are art-related museums, revitalization initiatives, and civic engagement projects, and whereas the City of Sheboygan recognizes that investment in its creative economy is critical for local and statewide success for these reasons, the arts mean business. According to Dun & Bradstreet, there are nearly 10,000 businesses in Wisconsin involved in the creation or distribution of the arts that employ over 42,000 people, representing 3.2 of the state's uh, businesses and 1.4% of its employees. The arts engage and add to Sheboygan's economy. A recent economic impact study released by Lakeland University identified that the creative economy of Sheboygan County impacts $882 per person in the dollar value, or 1.2% of the overall total economy. The arts also drive tourism. Arts travelers are ideal tourists, staying longer and spending more time to seek out authentic cultural experiences. The U.S. Department of Commerce reports that the percentage of international travelers, including museum visits on their trip, has grown steadily since 2003, from 18 to 28 percent. The arts also spark creativity and innovation. The conference board reports that creativity is among the top five applied skills that are taught by business leaders with 72% saying creativity is of high importance when hiring. They're ready to innovate report concludes that the arts, music, and creative writing drawing and dance provide skills taught by employers of the third Nobel laureates in the sciences are 17 times more likely to be accurately, I mean, actively engaged in the arts and other scientists. The arts have a social impact. Research shows that a high concentration of the arts in a community leads to higher civic engagement, more social co uh, cohesion, and higher child welfare and lower crime and poverty rates. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Sheboygan declares the week of May 13th through 20th of 2017 as Creative Economy Week to celebrate and promote the arts, creativity, vitality, and for our community. And furthermore, the City of Sheboygan requests that the City Clerk send a copy of this resolution <coughs> to our state legislators, to Governor Walker, and the League of Municipalities. I'd like to present this to Kim. Can you have a few words? So thank you. Like the mayor said, we were I was under the privilege of leading a 14-week class at Lakeland University, and it was very, very um, helpful, and it was a great experience. I've brought Hannah Shear along, who's a student in the class, to give her perspective as well. So, um, As a student, all the time we hear things like, you know, you're taking your business degree, you're going to learn the terms, but once you get out in the field, you have to learn on your own. <coughs> And having this class as a hands-on experience where we actually learned what we were doing and did real market research made me feel a little bit more pre prepared to go into the workforce later on. So I would just want to thank the City of Sheboygan and the John Michael Kohler Art Center for giving us this opportunity. On Friday, May 19th of 2017, the city of Sheboygan and Esslingen will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of our sister city at a banquet in Esslingen, Germany. A delegation of 34 persons will travel to Germany with Fire Chief Mike Romas and myself. Uh, on, we're leaving tomorrow to participate in this event. Included in this delegation will be members of the Mayor's International Committee, people to people, and residents of the Sheboygan area. On January 16th of 1967, the City of Sheboygan Common Council recognized and endorsed the sister city relationship with Esslingen. This was done with the hope that it would lead to a lasting friendship between the peoples of Esslingen and Necker and Germany uh, and Sheboygan, Wisconsin, USA. During this time, I'm the ninth Sheboygan mayor to participate and preserve this partnership with our colleagues and Esslingen city government. During this time, many young students have enjoyed and learned from the visits uh, to Esslingen and uh, Esslingen's to Sheboygan. The exchange students have made lifelong friendships and their families have adopted the students and family of their German partners. During the past 50 years, many individuals have had the privileged responsibility of keeping this relationship strong and meaningful. I extend a special thanks to the past city councils, 
mayors, international committees, former mayors, people to people, youth chaperones, city staff, and the local families who are participating in student exchanges. All has helped to nurture and strengthen this very special relationship with our friends from Esslingen, and we will be celebrating this anniversary because of all these efforts over the past 50 years. And then I uh, just want to give everybody a reminder about Memorial Day coming up on May 29th. Activities will begin with a parade at 9 o'clock. And uh, after the parade, we'll be having uh, a program at Fountain Park. We want to thank the employees of the Cooler Credit Union for organizing this Memorial Day celebration. And I also want to announce that a public informational meeting on the proposed annexation of property to the city of Sheboygan will be held on May 30th as part of a city planning commission meeting that will be held here in the council chambers and it will take place at our normal meeting time of 4 o'clock on Tuesday. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a hearing. Item 2.1 is hearing number 2 of 1718 relating to the proposed ordinance regarding impact fees in accordance with Wisconsin Statute 66.0617 to pay for park and recreation facilities that are required to serve new development in our community. Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I make a motion to close the hearing. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of closing the hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. That will include items 3.2 through 3.11. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. Make a motion to accept and file all ROs, accept and adopt all RCs, and pass all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Those documents are before us. Is there any discussion on anything in the consent agenda? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Eyes. Motion passes. Item 4 is reports of officers. Item 4.1 is RO number 19 of 1718 by the Director of Human Resources and Labor Relations and the Fire Chief pursuant to resolution number 227 of 1617 submitted a report of the audit and review of the fire department's job descriptions, the identification of any overlapping duties and responsibilities and any recommendations resulting from the study. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to um, accept and file. Second. I have a motion and a second. Under discussion, I'd like to call up uh, Fire Chief Mike Romas and our uh, HR Director, Sandy, and uh, they'll give us a little synopsis of uh, this report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you all received, I believe last week, Friday by 5 o'clock, you received uh, an IFC, an item for consideration, and in it was a document attached to five pages that explained the results of our findings. Those findings are, um, we agreed on them both. Um, Sandy took the lead because she was from outside of our department, uh, looking at it from a third-party perspective. And in, in synopsis uh, for resolution 227-1617, we did conduct job description reviews. This is the third time that I've done it, but we did it again this time, looking at it again fresh. Sandy was involved, and we have determined that um, they are complete, there is no overlap, and they will stand as is in our opinion. The second thing was deficiencies, and we believe that there are two deficiencies in the department, and they are, again, they were identified in my FIRE 2020 report, the staffing <laughs> levels of the department. Um, the management staffing levels are low, and I believe that the fire staffing levels are also low. So those two deficiencies were identified. What has been done to, um, to uh, take care of this issue has been that FIRE 2020 plan, 
which I presented to the council. Um, some of the newer members, I believe, did not receive that. I sent that to you today so that you could be more aware of what's going on. I'm always available, as I'm sure Sandy is also, for any questions that anybody might have. But um, to address those deficiencies, uh, we reinstituted the three positions that were vacant this year. And J July 1st, we're going to add a battalion chief to the staff, which is going to help greatly, but that won't completely solve the issues of the problem. And in 18, I'm requesting three more firefighters and another battalion chief, and in 19, three more firefighters. And that's my fire 2020 plan, which addresses this issue. Sandy, did you have anything you wanted to say? That's all I have, unless anyone has any questions. Under discussion, uh, other person, Donahue. No, I managed to disconnect my microphone. Um, uh, I appreciate the work that was done here. Um, I see that in the report there's section one, but there's no section two. Um, I found that the, the conclusion was certainly strong, but I didn't see any supporting information. Um, Chief, I think you <laughs> rightly identified we do have new alders uh, on council. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I think you also understand that your proposed budget expenditures will break the bank, essentially. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and violate our expenditure restraints and so forth. So it seems to me that you've got a good basis here, and I really appreciate Sandy Rorick's so intense, I am sure, uh, attention to this. But it seems to me to make sense that at this point that we refer, um, and my motion is to refer this report uh, to uh, uh, finance and personnel for further discussion and review, maybe take a look at section two, and discuss some of those deficiencies in more detail. Second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Um, we have two of them on the floor, Chuck. <coughs> motion to report takes precedence. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? We don't need a roll. We can do that in voice vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. That will be referred to uh, finance and HR. Thank you very much for your work on the report. Thank you. Item 4.2 and 4.3 will lie over. Items 4.4 .4 through 4.13 will be referred to various committees. Under resolutions, items 5.1 through 5.5 will be referred to various committees. And uh, item six, reports of committees. Item 6.1 is RC number nine of 1718 by finance and personnel. To whom was referred RO number one of 1718 by the city administrator submitting the city of Sheboygan citizen engagement program for consideration and recommends establishing a citizen engagement program to authorize the implementation of the program. Alder person Don Hugh. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I move to uh, accept and adopt. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Motion passes. Item 6.2 is RC number 20 of 1718 by finance and personnel. To was referred resolution number 10 of 1718 by all the person Donahue, authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2017 budget to establish an appropriation for parking lot improvements and tax dis increment district number 12 and recommends passing the resolution. All the person Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I move to accept, adopt, and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. 
Item 6.3 is RC number 21 of 1718 by finance and personnel to whom was referred resolution number 13 of 1718 by Alderperson Donahue authorizing a loan from the trust fund of the state of Wisconsin in the sum of $400,000 for TID 16 housing project and recommends passing the resolution. Alderperson Donahue. Uh, thank you. I move to accept, adopt, and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll. Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.4 is RC number 22 of 1718 by Public Works to whom is referred resolution number 14 of 1718 by Alderperson Wolf authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with Bray and Associates for phase two project implementation for city hall remodeling design development construction documents including bidding and negotiation as well as construction management. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and adopt and pass resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Twelve eyes, one no. Motion passes. Item 6.5 is RC number 12 of 1718 by law and licensing to whom was referred pursuant to RO number 295 of 1617 by the city clerk submitting various license application and recommends denying the beverage operator's license uh, 9763 based upon his ineligibility for a license. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I move to accept and adopt. Thank you for that motion and support. Under discussion? Uh, this is the application of John Wenzel. Is Mr. Wenzel here? Uh, he is not. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Wenzel, because of some activity uh, two decades ago, is ineligible for a license, and accordingly, the committee denied the application. Thank you very much. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.6 .6 is RC number 13 of 1718 by law and licensing to whom was referred pursuant to RO number 295 of 1617 by the city clerk submitting various licensed applications and recommends denying beverage operators license number 1492 based upon his inel ineligibility for a license and his failure to cooperate with the committee. Alderperson Donahue. I move to accept and adopt. Thank you for the motion and support under discussion. Is uh, Mr. Potterwills here? Uh, he is not. Mr. Potterwills did not appear uh, at the Law and Licensing Committee on May 9th and is, uh, in addition, uh, ineligible for a license. Accordingly, the committee uh, voted to deny his application. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. Six point seven is RC number fourteen of seventeen eighteen by law and licensing to whom was referred pursuant to RO number two ninety five of sixteen seventeen by the city clerk submitting various licensed applications and recommends denying beverage operators license number fifteen forty based upon his failure to accurate review all relevant convictions on his license application, his record of violations related to the license activity, and his record as a repeat law offender. Alderperson Donahue. I move to accept and adopt. Second. Is Thanks for, for that motion and support under discussion. Is Chris Amador here? Mr. Amador is not. He did not appear at the hearing. 
uh, and based on the information and the resolution, the committee uh, voted to deny his uh, application. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> 13 ayes. Motion passes. Next, we'll go on to other matters received after the agenda was published. City Attorney. 7.1 first. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 7.1 is general ordinance number uh, 3 of 1718 by Alder Person <coughs> Wolf, Schneider, Bitters, Bellinger, and Nelson, creating Article 3 of Chapter 74, the Municipal Code relating to impact fees. Um, Alder Person Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to suspend and pass ordinance. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Alderperson Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am objecting to the uh, suspension. I'd like to see it go back to co committee. There's some ambiguities in the language. There's some uh, opportunities for other uh, people to uh, meet in, in committee venue. So rather than discuss it on the on the full, and take up the time of the uh, full council, I'd like, as I say, I'd like to see it go back to committee or go to committee. Okay, is there a second? Okay, we have further discussion on a motion uh, to send back to committee. Uh, I'd like the administrator to chime in. Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, by placement of this on the agenda with an earlier public hearing this evening, uh, there was a step in the process that the city council or the common council's uh, based upon staff's recommendation uh, was omitted. Uh, so the public hearing was held and consistent with state statute uh, earlier tonight. Um, uh, one item I wanted to address to you tonight is that uh, between the approval date uh, and tonight, uh, we have collected zero uh, monies associated with this, with this new fee. It's $547 per d residential dwelling unit. Uh, we do anticipate uh, one of our key downtown apartment projects uh, will be coming in within the next two weeks. Uh, earlier this evening, there was a loan associated with uh, additional incentive that we were providing this project. As part of the discussions with that developer, uh, it, it became, we, the staff, uh, made it known to that developer uh, that this new park impact fee uh, was was in place and that they would incur this cost. Uh, my concern is if this is suspended and referred back to committee, that potentially that permit could be submitted and ultimately this developer could avoid what will be, uh, I did the math earlier, a 91 units times 547,000, which is $49,777. Times so 541,000? $49,777. So my concern is uh, if this is uh, referred back to committee, potentially the city would uh, not receive uh, that impact fee on that specific project. The uh, city attorney has reminded me that we can't have two motions on the floor at the same time. So the first one we have to dispense with is, first of all, the motion to suspend. And if that's upheld, then we go on to a motion to pass the ordinance, and then we can consider another motion. So uh, right now we, we, uh, we have a... Uh, somebody who, who doesn't want to see us suspend the rules on the floor. So uh, we'll take a vote on suspension. So an I vote would be to suspend the rules and allow us to vote on this tonight. Uh, an A vote would be against that, that we would not consider this tonight. It also does have to pass by a three quarters margin of those elected. So it would need 12 votes to pass. Yep, everybody okay. understand? So your votes are uh, ready to be entered. Yes, to clarify. Let me clarify a little bit. If we vote aye on this, we're voting in favor of the funds? No, you're voting to discuss it, and then we'd have to have another motion to approve the project, and I mean to, to approve the ordinance. So this is just allowing us to discuss it further tonight and, and bring it up for consideration. 
So an I vote would be to allow to suspend and discuss it. Alderperson Bellinger? Um, I don't have anything else. I just wanted clarification on the reason to suspend. So Thank I would, you know, that's been clarified. Thank you. Did you, uh, did you get what you wanted from the administrator's report? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody know what they're voting on? Okay. I might want to just review that one more time. So a, a nay <laughs> vote. Okay, there's a motion out there to suspend the rules. That's all we're voting on is just to suspend the rules, not on the document. An I vote would be to suspend. A nay vote would be not to suspend the rules. Ten eyes, three notes. So it lies over because you can take no further action. Okay, uh, next we'll go on to other matters received after the agenda was published. City Attorney. Yes, I'm just making notes here. 8.1 is a resolution authorizing the purchasing agent to enter into a contract for a court-ordered raise order demolition of the residential four-unit commercial property located at 1114 North 10th Street. That'll be referred to the Finance and Personnel Committee. 8.2 is a, an RC by Public Safety uh, to whom was referred an RO by the City Clerk submitting a communication from Angela Smith who resides at 1410 Illinois Avenue raising concerns <coughs> regarding activities of Thomas Industries uh, allegedly violating noise and lighting ordinances of the city of Sheboygan. Um, that'll be referred to the City Planning Commission. 8.3 uh, is an RO by the City Clerk submitting a communication from Reinhardt Attorneys at Law at the request of their client Kohler Company, a Wisconsin corporation, in closing the annexation petition for lands in the vicinity of Stahl Road, County Highway KK, and 12th Street, County V, in the town of Wilson. That'll be referred to the City Planning Commission. 8.4 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending December 31, 2017, June 30, 2018, and June 30, 2019. That'll be referred to the Law and Licensing Committee. 8.5 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending December 31, 2017, June 30, 2018, and June 30, 2019. That'll be referred to the Law and Licensing Committee. 8.6 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting an application from the Kohler Company for a change in the zoning classification of property being the entire area included in the annexation petition as shown on an attached map received and dated May 15, 2017 from Town of Wilson P1A2A3R1 to Class Suburban Residential SR5 classification. That will be referred to the City Planning Commission. Uh, 8.7 is a resolution uh, by all the persons Boren and Sorensen directing a public hearing to be held in connection with the change in the zoning classification of property being the entire area included in the annexation petition as shown on the attached map received and dated on M Monday, May 15, 2017 from Town of Wilson P1A2A3NR1 to Class Suburban Residential SR5 classification. That would be referred to the City Planning Commission. 8.8 .8 is a general ordinance by all the persons born in Sorensen amending the City of Sheboygan official zoning map of the Sheboygan zoning ordinance to change the use district classification of property being the entire area included in the annexation petition as shown on the attached map received and dated May 15, 2017 
from Town of Wilson P1, A2, A3, and R1 to Class Suburban Residential SR5 classification. That will be referred to the City Planning Commission. Alderperson Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Attorney Adams, is there any opportunity to reconsider 7.1? Uh, if uh, someone wishes to uh, uh, reconsider uh, their vote, um, and one of the uh, three aldermen who uh, uh, voted against um, the uh, uh, motion to suspend, that could be done. Alderman Warren. Thank you. Uh, I reviewed this document back when I was on Public Works, I believe, the last session when uh, Alderman Bellinger was chairman of the last committee. And I had some misgivings about this, but after reading it and the impact that this can have, and particularly the impact that uh, uh, Mr. Hofflin uh, expressed with this development down there, we're passing up over $90,000 in impact fees. Uh, I wish one of the people that voted no not to, not to pass this tonight would reconsider because we're, we're going to be missing out on over $90,000 in impact fees. And, we're only going to get one kick at the cat on that on that development. So I would encourage one of the three nays to maybe reconsider so we can get this passed and that we don't miss out on this over $90,000. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry, just to clarify, uh, the amount is $49,777. Still significant. Significant. Another person, Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, at first, I, I, uh, had, I was interested in having the not being suspended and returning to our committee because it seems like it, from the very start, this was kind of a, not a problematic, but a uh, uh, certain amount of inconsistencies in how it was done because, because of the lack of uh, of following state statutes when it was first approved by the previous board. And so that's why it came back tonight, as I understand. And um, uh, I understand the, uh, the, uh, the monetary implications uh, is, again, however, um, it also has implications for, uh, for some of the uh, existing property owners that own lots uh, in the city that uh, won't be quite, that are vacant you know, for development. And um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, I would uh, make a motion to reconsider that. Thank you for that motion to reconsider. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion to reconsider on the floor. Any debate? Uh, no, no debate. Okay, will the court please call the roll for reconsideration? Hold on. Alderman Wolf, did you second that? Yes. I vote would be to reconsider. Everybody got that? Yes. Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. Okay, item 7.1 is before us again. Is there any further discussion? Alderperson Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, one last comment. Uh, hopefully in the future some of this can be done in a more timely manner so that, uh, you know, there are critical points and all of a sudden we need to do something at 11.59 p.m. to, you know, to, to get it done correctly. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Alder Person Bourne. Uh, I think this is germane. Would it still be possible if we, if we suspend and pass this ordinance tonight, is it still possible maybe for the Public Works Department to take a second look at it? Yes, if you, um, if you uh, pass it now tonight having suspended the rules or having rescinded the objection to suspending the rules, um, you can always amend an ordinance uh, to, to make changes to it. So if this if this passes, maybe maybe uh, Alderman Nelson would want to make remake his motion to have the Public Works Committee take another look at it. I, I, if that's a possibility, thank you. 
Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Just as a clarification, are we voting to suspend and pass again? Voting to suspend and pass, correct. Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. Next is a contemplated closed session. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion uh, to convene in closed session under the exemption provided in Section 19.85 sub 1 sub e of the Wisconsin Stats, where competitive and bargaining reasons uh, require a closed session related to the land in the town of Wilson adjacent to I-43. I, for second, rather. I'm sorry. Thank you for that motion and support. Would the clerk please call the roll for closed session? Motion passes. I'd just like to alert the viewing public that the council will be adjourning in closed session, so this will end our broadcast for this evening. We'll take a five-minute recess and reconvene.